safe streets, vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veteran services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member board of commissioners and our county administrator controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong, solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level, as well as the Board of Commissioners. And um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community. And vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run. Good morning, today is uh, Tuesday, January 26th. It's a little past 8.30. In the morning, this is a meeting of the Legislative and Human Resources Committee. We'll call this meeting to order. First thing on the agenda is public comment. Do we have any public comment today for the committee? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the second item on the agenda, approval of the minutes from the January 12, 2016 meeting. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I would move it. So a motion by Commissioner Vaughn, support by Commissioner Tan. Questions or comments on the minutes? Okay, seeing none, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And motion carries. <coughs> Next item on the agenda is a legislative update from Public Affairs Associates. We have with us this morning Becky Beckler. Good morning, Becky. Good morning. We didn't have any snow coming in this morning, which was a very uneventful drive, so I appreciate that. <laughs> the state police are out, though, however, so that can <laughs> be tricky. So good, good morning. Uh, the legislature is back in full session. Uh, it's a little bit quiet in the month of January, which is typical. Uh, they, the legislature does start out a little slowly until the governor is uh, enabled to give his state of the state address, which he gave last Tuesday evening. It was probably his most difficult state of the state of the address, uh, given the, the, the conversation that he was going to have with the legislature. It was the first time in the six times he's delivered that that he actually read from a prepared text. It's our understanding that the governor actually rewrote his state of the state address in the days just uh, upcoming to that so that he could focus 
uh, as much attention as possible on the Flint water crisis, of which he did. And he really came away with two takeaways from the Flint conversation. And the first was asking the legislature to uh, move a $28 million supplemental for, for Flint. And that's something that the House has already done and the Senate is likely to bring up this week. That $28 million will go from everything to actually replacing uh, fixtures, to uh, hiring school nurses, to uh, paying for the National Guard that has, to, has been called in to help with the water disbursement and other programs. So that's something that we anticipate will probably be on the governor's desk by the end of this week. The second takeaway is the governor uh, didn't follow his uh, freedom of information uh, request that he has that ability to do and, and indicate that he would release his emails. He'd been, he, he and his administration have been under siege over what he, what that administration knew and when did they know it. So he did uh, release his 2014 and 15 emails as it, as it dealt with the Flint water situation as he, as he said he would. Um, the governor also said that he would propose a more long-term solution when it came to Flint water in the governor's budget proposal, which he's planned to release on February 10th. So we look forward to having hear more about that. The second difficult conversation was dealing with Detroit Public Schools. And this is a conversation that the governor has been having with the legislature for several months, if not a year. He, uh, it is likely that the Detroit Public Schools will run out of money before the end of the school year and risk um, not being able to pay their vendors. He's asked the legislature to help with the, help with the, the Detroit Public School situation. He has been proposing uh, several solutions. Rep Senator Jeff Hansen has actually started that conversation in the Senate. He introduced two bills. Uh, it's difficult to say how the legislature will address this. What the governor is asking for is to actually recreate uh, Detroit public school systems, create an old system of which would carry the debt, which is uh, about $750 million. So he's asking the legislature to help at $70 million for 10 years, and then create a new Detroit public school system where they would move on and attract a solvency. It's something that has met with a lot of resistance from the <coughs> legislature. They want to know how we are putting this in place so that this won't happen again. So I think you're going to see a lot of conversation, a lot of hearings before anything happens with that, even though there is a time clock moving and the fact that they have just until probably April or May before they run out of money. So those two issues really are going to take up a lot of the conversation in Lansing over the next several months, especially when it comes to the budget. Uh, the, both are high price tags, um, and so if anybody is affected by the budget, they're a little nervous about where will the governor come up with the money to address those two issues, and will it take away from other key issues within the budget. So there's a lot of nervousness in Lansing in, in anticipation of that budget. The governor also calls for, called for a commission to deal with infrastructure so that we study where are, where are we as a state when it comes to our water pipelines, our gas pipelines, uh, sewage system, and, and is also going to be giving the uh, Department of Transportation an, an executive order requiring them to work with local units of government so that when they are repairing a road, they're talking to the local government about what they need to do as far as infrastructure and repairs. So that's something that we also anticipate will happen uh, quite soon as well. And as a response to the Flint water crisis, the Attorney General has also announced a formal investigation. He has uh, hired outside counsel, as he announced uh, earlier this week, and that's going to be forthcoming as well. It's probably a, a pretty aggressive uh, investigation that he's going to hold. And in addition, Representative Edmund Broom from the Upper Peninsula, who chairs the House Oversight Committee, has indicated he's going to start hearings in March on the Flint water. So as you can see from all different facets, the Flint water conversation is going to continue and probably take quite a bit of the conversation as we go into uh, May and June. There's an issue that is actually going through the legislature that we're paying close attention to. And if you'll recall in December, a piece of legislation, Senate Bill 571, moved through the legislature pretty quickly and was signed by, by the governor. It's now Public Act 269. It does have an impact on local units of government. It's referred to as the gag rule and limiting how you can communicate and when you can communicate to, to your public. Um, the governor signed the bill under great duress. He asked both leaders if, if he signed this, would they agree to fix this provision in the bill? Uh, both leaders indicated they would take a look at it. Uh, it's starting in the House. Representative Lyons, who chairs the House Election Committee, has started that conversation with a hearing last week. The proposal that is in that committee does not quite go far enough. It's not a solution to the problem as we see it. Uh, there are two bills, one in the House and the Senate, that actually repeal that provision, and that's what we are seeking. But at that moment in time, the conversation that is going on in the House election does not uh, solve our problem. We're going to continue to monitor that very closely to find a solution that works for the local units of government. 
We believe that t sometime today there's a coalition of school districts and local units of government that are going to file suit and ask the courts to uh, actually find this law unconstitutional. They're going to announce that today. So uh, we have a two-track system here. We have the court system that may take a look at this as well as the legislative solution that we're hoping uh, is also is successful in our way. There are also some legislative priorities. Uh, legislative leaders have outlined their priorities. Clearly, auto no fault reform continue, continues to be a priority for both Senator Beekoff and Representative Cotter. Uh, the challenge for them is getting a bill that the House of Representatives will pass. Right now, there's a bill sitting on the House floor. However, there are anywhere from 15 to 25 Republicans that uh, will not support uh, that current version of auto no-fault reform, and no Democrats are uh, supporting it. So that's going to be the challenge for them if they do want to get something done by the end of the year. Criminal justice reform is also on both leaders' agenda. Clearly, presumptive parole is something that's not going to happen. It's uh, dead in the Senate. But uh, Senator John Prose, who chairs the Senate subcommittee on corrections, is working on an alternative solution. He, at this time, is not giving anybody any details about what that might include, but we're watching what he does and proposes very closely, because I know we had some uh, significant concerns with presumptive parole, and if he's going down that path, we're going to want to be able to examine that closely. In the House Criminal Justice Committee, they're also taking a look and likely to move in February um, the juveniles uh, age up, dealing with juveniles and how they are treated uh, in the court system from 16 to 17 and 17 to 18. I believe this could also has some financial implications on the county, so we're watching that very closely. Working with the committee chairs, it's a 10-bill package, so we're trying to find some solutions. It could be very costly to the county as it's introduced, so we'll continue to watch those as well. Uh, the budget is going to be very concerning. Will the governor hold harmless on revenue sharing and other key issues that are important to the county? We're going to be watching that very closely because of the other strenuous items that uh, are likely to be addressed in the budget. Uh, part of the budget is um, something that's moving. It's on the Senate floor right now. It's called the HICA tax, the Health Insurance Claims Tax. It's important because it garners or should garner about $450 million to the Medicaid General Fund. Um, that's important. It's something that was part of the transportation package. The governor agreed that he would, he would uh, support the legislative package on transportation if they would vote for his health insurance claims tax. It's a continuation. It's something that we have right now uh, to replace the use tax on Medicaid HMOs. Um, it's something that the federal government is threatening to take away. Um, it only garners about $300 million. I think the anticipation of that it needs $450 million. If the Senate is unable to pass that, that could also put a huge strain on the budget, so we're watching that closely. Um, other bills that are up, updating the state's energy law, the legislature have been working very diligently on that. It seems to be losing a little bit of energy, if you will. Um, they were unable to, in December, move it off the House floor. There's too many issues that they cannot come into agreement on. Senator Noss, who chairs the Senate Energy Committee, is going to take one more uh, stab at it this, this winter, try to get something moving that he can get uh, some consensus around. If not, it's likely that that may uh, be washed off to the side and not able to accomplish. Um, those are really the issues that are going on. As I said, it's a little slower start. Uh, usually the legislature starts a little slow in January. They have some caucus retreats where they put together their agendas. And so we anticipate the end of January and 1st of February, they'll really start to get uh, much more aggressive on committee assignments. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Becky. Any questions? <coughs> could, could I? Mr. Mask? Could. You know, some, I think last May there was a, a bill submitted or, or introduced regarding the Michigan jury selection process, House Bills 4406 and 4407. Is there any thing happening with those or any interest? You know what I'm I do not know off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to take a look at that and get back with you today. Yeah, could you? Absolutely. Okay. One of my constituents is raising. Okay. Some questions. Other questions for Becky this morning? Commissioner Callan. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Becky. Good morning. Do you have any um, any kind of update on uh, TIFA, the potential TIFA legislation? What's happening with that? Is there any activity right now? There isn't any formal legislative activity. There have been a couple work groups uh, they continue to have, but there's nothing that they're comfortable putting forward as of yet. Uh, I just had a conversation with uh, the individuals at the Michigan Association of Counties about that, and, and it's still in the development, developmental stages. So I don't have anything specific yet that I am able to share with you, but it's in the works. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Becky this morning? 
right, seeing none, thank you, Becky. Appreciate thank you. your hard work and your update this morning. Thanks. Next up on the agenda is an action request from Human Resources regarding a labor agreement <coughs> from the Police Officers, Labor Council, Captains, and Lieutenants. This is a request to recommend to the board to approve a three-year labor agreement for the period January 1, 2016 through December 31st, 2018 between the county and the police officers labor council representing the captains and lieutenants in the sheriff's department. The negotiating committee recommends approval of a three-year labor contract with the police officers labor council uh, captains lieutenants. This represents 21 members. Wages will increase 2% annually in 2016, 2017, and 2018. In 2016, employees, uh, the employee's share of health care premiums will increase from 17.5% to 20% and $250 single, $500 family deductibles will be added to the HMO plan. In 2018, the out-of-pocket pocket maximum will increase by $1,000 with a corresponding reduction of $1,000 in the prescription out-of-pocket maximum to maintain compliance with the limits set forth under Public Law 111. 148. Existing holiday banks will be maintained, but no further additions will be permitted. The pension plan employee contribution cap will increase from 8.5% of pay to 9.5% of pay, effective January 1, 2017. Uh, the additional employee contributions to fund the cost of living adjustment still applies. Um, the county may reopen uh, regarding dual tier vacation and paid vac time off upon resolution of these issues in the Police Officers Association of Michigan and Kent County Deputy Sheriff's Association units. The county may reopen a uh, contract regarding placement of the pension plan, uh, non-duty disability to an insured disability program upon completion uh, in the POAM and KCDSA uh, units. The total three-year increase to salary and benefit costs is $246,690. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. A motion by Commissioner Thorndike and a support by Commissioner Mast. Questions or comments on the motion? Commissioner Steck? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Darrell, can you just comment a little bit? What does it uh, mean when it says the county may reopen? Well, we are uh, going to be negotiating with, and Amy, you can come up and you fill in any blanks I leave. The county is in the process of still negotiating with the Kent County Deputy Sheriff's Association, which, which covers corrections and detention, uh, corrections employees. And then uh, uh, next year, 2017, I believe, we start negotiating with the Police Officers Association of Michigan, which represents the law enforcement unit of the sheriff's department and there are a couple of things that we want to look at in those contracts and then if those are successful we would uh, reopen the contract with the with the captains and lieutenants to sort of like a me too thing or see that if they would be willing to agree to the same provisions the contract would basically reserve the issue for that yes. consideration yes any other questions commissioner talent thank you chair Darrell, can you um, perhaps summarize, because I don't see it in here, what's different from where we were when we couldn't come to agreement before, <coughs> or what changed there? That okay. one I'll let Amy <laughs> answer. <laughs> Amy Rolston, our Director of Human Resources. Thanks. Uh, the, the process, uh, particularly with a, a unit that, that is eligible for compulsory ar arbitration under 312, tends to be pretty fluid and you know, I, I can't point to any single thing. It was just a matter of kind of getting down to the, the, the very kind of last best final offer that, that each party decided what was fair and making the determination of whether it was acceptable. Perhaps if I could rephrase it, um, what's different here from what the county's kind of standard position that, that we were trying to go after in the contracts? Sure. Um, regarding health insurance, pension, Pro those kinds of things? Probably the biggest thing is the, the captains and lieutenants felt very strongly that the, uh, the people who are members in that unit are promoted from either the road patrol union or from the union that represents corrections officers. So us agreeing to allow them to postpone the determination of how some of the, the elements that, uh, like the dual tier time off and the, uh, 
the, the long-term disability plan to postpone those and allow them to be resolved in those units where people would be promoted from those units into the captain's and lieutenant's unit. I think that was probably the most critical thing for them. If I, so I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting to where I okay. want to be here, yeah. but uh, if I could keep asking. Um, okay. So those were a couple of the things that were potentially significantly different from the other contracts that we've already That's uh, right. agreed upon with, with other yeah. groups. Um, okay, all right, thanks. Any other questions or comments regarding the motion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oppose, same sign. Okay, motion carries. Next up on the agenda is Commissioner Miscellaneous. <coughs> is there any Commissioner Miscellaneous this morning? Okay, seeing none, I actually have a couple. Um, you'll notice that our next meeting date is for Tuesday, February 9, and we will have a work session at 8 a.m., and that's to discuss legislative priorities. Um, just kind of a nice follow-up to what we heard from Becky this morning. And then I also wanted to mention that the application deadline for the KDL vacancy um, for the Region 8, uh, that deadline was last Friday. We had a couple applications come in, and so I've appointed a subcommittee to review those applications and make a recommendation. Um, and the committee I've appointed is Commissioner Mast, Commissioner Talon, and Commissioner Antor. So we look forward to you um, sitting in with those applicants and making a good decision based on that. So with uh, no further miscellaneous, uh, we'll go ahead and call this meeting adjourned. I am Kent County. I am Kent County. I am Kent County. We are 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 Kent County. Bayah Kent County. Ami Kent County. Somos Kent County. Masira Kent County. We, we are Kent County. We are Kent County. We are Kent County. Oh yeah.